I started digging through the All-22. I gotta tell you, man, I think Jonathan Gannon, he did a pretty good job play calling this past Monday night. Let's go over a few plays on third down I want to point out and show you guys what I'm seeing here. All right, y'all, let's jump into this one. What's up, Cerebral Football fans? My name is Steven Heyer. This is Gay City Sports Channel. Hey, if you're new to the channel, it's maybe the first, second, third time you caught my content and you enjoyed today's discussion. Look, we just crossed over 6,300 subscribers. We're on a journey, a path towards 7,500. I would love for you to join the Cerebral community, be a part of this. Just need you to subscribe to do that. It's my OG subscribers. You already know what I'm going to ask you to do, guys. Hit that thumbs up button, smash the like button, help me spike the algorithm and get this in front of new people that we can potentially convert into our little audience here on YouTube. All right, y'all. Today's topic. So I started off by just taking a look at some analytics. I wanted to know how much man coverage Jonathan Gannon was playing in the, you know, in this particular game. Because sometimes, you know, you see something on the TV copy and, and you think something's true, but you really don't know until you get a chance to really see the coach's film on it, to get a, a chance to, to diagnose the game two or three times, to really get a feel for what was going on. And uh, what I came away with was this, guys. When I went back and I was watching the film, okay, I was like, huh, there's a lot of man coverage being played here. So I was like, all right, let me go look and see the total snaps. And I saw that between Avante Maddox, between Darius Slay, and between James Bradbury, there's about 14 snaps played inside of man coverage. Now, each guy played a different amount of snap total, so that impacted how often they were in man coverage. You know, James Bradbury was right under 27%. Avante Maddox was like right at 30%. And then you got Darius Slay was like 34% man coverage snaps with those 14. So I was like, all right, my hunch is probably the same as your hunch is right now. I said, they had 12 third downs. They were 4-12 on third down, right? 33%. Very good job by our defense. I bet you they played a ton of man coverage on those third downs. And it did hold true. Definitely, I saw that on the film that they were playing man coverage on third down. As a matter of fact, in the first two possessions... Both third downs that we came away with a pass breakup was through man coverage. And I'll take you right now to the first one, which was Darius Slays. It's the first possession. It's a third down. They're going to try to work the ball in here to Justin Jefferson. They're going to their playmaker. And this is a good job right here of Jonathan Gannon just trusting his playmakers in the corners to play a little physical with these guys and go win you a football game. Let them play loosely. Let them play what they're doing. So, like, right away I was like, okay, like, my hunch seems to be right, right? I go and I see the second possession, right? I'm watching the second possession. I'm like, okay, well, this one's a little different wrinkle, right? Because I can see the guys that are kind of towards the, the top of the screen are, are absolutely kind of matched up in man. But then you can see that they have kind of like an inline tight end to the top. of. Well, I guess that would be the top of the screen compared to the bottom of the screen. So I'm looking at James Bradbury and like, well, this one might be different because, you know, obviously he's not going to come up and press an inline tight end. But let me just see what happens at the snap. Let me see if he stays in man coverage. And he did. To Bradbury's credit here, he's in man coverage. He breaks on the ball perfectly, gets in there with that 32 and a half inch, 33 inch wingspan, somewhere in that area, guys. He's got a huge wingspan and breaks the pass up, right? Gannon, once again, trusting his guys to go out there and make plays. And if we stuck to every third down with just going at him with man coverage and playing physical like this, I would have had no complaints because it's just putting the ball game in the hands of your guys. But Gannon did more than that. Now I want to switch gears, guys. And I want to stop talking so much about man coverage. And I want to show you what impressed the crap out of me about Jonathan Gannon. And it was the change-up that he gave us when it came to how he started mixing up his coverages in the later parts of the game. So, the first thing I want to go to is an inverted cover two. And I'm going to call it an inverted cover two, which comes on, like, basically the fifth possession of the game. So... When I say something like an inverted cover two, what I'm talking about is you're going to bring your safeties down into the box. They're going to basically play the flats, and your corners are going to go back and play the back halves. This was a staple of Jim Schwartz, by the way. Jim Schwartz used to love to play the inverted cover two, and to be honest about Jim Schwartz, he had a ton of success doing this. The first time I saw it, I was like, okay, am I missing? I thought I was like looking at a cover six or something like that, and I said, no. Actually, if you really pay attention, they're playing one safety kind of down into the box already, and then post snap they bring the other safety down, you see both those quarters kind of go corners go into like an inverted cover two concept where they're playing over the top. Uh, Maddox ends up carrying his guy, which I think is Justin Jefferson down the field. That's why it might look a little funny, but that just has to do with like designations at the line and who you pick up 
depending on the route that they run. So right away, you get an inverted cover two, and I was like, hmm, this is interesting stuff coming out of the defense, right? This is more creative in terms of the play calling than I was expecting to see here. But that wasn't it either. I'm going to fast forward our conversation to the eighth possession of the game. Right? Some around like the eighth possession of the game, okay? So we're going deep into the game. There's two third down, you know, situations on this possession. And both times I thought Gannon did something pretty unique here. And it was the fact that he went dime. So we only got one linebacker on the field. It happens to be mostly Kaiser White when I saw this happening. I think TJ Edwards was out there one time during one of these scenarios. But for the most part, it was Kaiser White as the dime linebacker. But he kind of went with a big dime. He started bringing in Kayvon Wallace and he started bringing in Josiah Scott to kind of play in this kind of big dime situation. It's where you got six defensive backs with three of them are safeties. And I was like, huh. This is kind of an interesting concept to where they want to get more guys onto the field, but they don't want to give up run support either, right? They want guys that could potentially still be able to get down and play into the box and provide the run support. Uh, the first one is kind of a prevent defense where you could kind of see it's a little frustrating, but to be honest with you, if Darius Slay breaks on that ball just a little faster, it was just great ball placement by, by Kirk Cousins, to be honest with you. It's just an out route, nothing special to this. Boom, hits the play. That sucks, man. They called us in a prevent. They, they took advantages there. But it's the second play. It's the second sequence on, on third down, right? If we come around, and once again, we're back in this big dime situation, right, where we got three safeties on the field, and you got six guys in coverage. Okay, that's what I mean when I say that, guys. But this time, they're coming out in what I would call a Tampa 2. So if you watch the Tampa 2 and you kind of watch the, uh, the Mike linebacker, you'll see that Mike linebacker is going to fall straight down the hash marks here. All right, then you got your two guys over the top. You're in a Tampa 2 here in a big dime situation. I mean, if we could have secured the tackle here on this possession, you know, we would have gotten out of this. That's the unfortunate part about the eighth possession. But it's not really, you know, we get into the nuances of, of execution and saying guys got to execute better, you know. It's hard to nitpick this one, guys, because the defense had such a good game, man. It feels foolish to even nitpick it like that. But, you know, Darius Slay missed an opportunity to, for a pass defense on the eighth possession and then we saw this one here. James Bradbury has a shot at making this tackle and putting them into a fourth down situation where they need to punt. Just kind of misses the tackle. It's a little unfortunate situation, but crap happens in a football game, guys. You know, what can you say? Um, but I thought the creativity here, right? Now we're starting to see this dime situation with a big dime with three safeties on the field. They're starting to use a little bit of disguise to what they're doing. They're mixing things up. They're not just going to give you just straight quarters. Now you're seeing some Tampa 2 mixed in. I thought things got real interesting. Then we got down to the red zone. And this red zone play on the very next possession is very important to pay attention to. What you guys are going to remember is, oh, this was the Darius Slate pick. But what I remember from this play is, this looks like a red 2. I think they're in a red 2 package here. So red 2 is just a form of... It's a form of cover two you play down inside. Generally speaking, you want, it's inside the 15 going forward, but they call it red two because red zone, basically. But generally speaking, you're going to be closer to the goal line than just the 20, right? You're going to be 15 yards or closer, basically, when you start going into red two defense. So easiest way to look at red two is to look and see if a, after the hike, if you don't see five guys almost in a perfect line. It's only a pretty good indicator you got red two defense going on there. Uh, generally speaking, what I see normally happens inside the red zone with the Eagles is a combination of three types of coverages. I see things like a red two. I see things like cover seven. And I'll say that I'll see at times some zero blitz stuff, right? Some kind of zero and they just bring pressure on you with it. They're, they're trying to get home with the blitz. So those are the three that I generally see from a conceptual standpoint in terms of the pass coverage. But in this particular situation, it definitely looks like a red two that Darius Slade takes from the you know defensive back. I mean, guys, I, I really loved what I saw here. I mean, there was even a point in this game to where on the eighth possession after they made the second conversion on us, okay, if you go back and you look at that, that situation, right, on the eighth possession where they convert both those third downs, man, Gannon came after them. Okay, Gannon was not playing around after that possession. Gannon started bringing a ton of pressure early on downs. There was one sequence where I think he brought like three consecutive blitzes on them. I think he put a little fear into Kevin O'Connell, if I'm being honest. The offensive coordinator, the head coach, really, of, of the Minnesota Vikings. I call him the OC. He's really OC. He's really the HC, the head coach and play caller there. But I thought he put a little fear in O'Connell. If you go to the kind of the ninth possession, tenth possession, no, it's the tenth possession of the game. 
It's like basically the, the final play of the game. You'll see an empty back set three by two. Why are you, why are you trying to go empty down around the 10-yard line? You want to you go zero in box. You're trying to do what they call zeroing out the box. What zeroing out the box means, guys, is that you want to take more guys outside of bringing pressure on you so that way you can try to make a quick read with the football in your hands. Matter of fact, give Jonathan Gannon his due here, guys, because we can make arguments, guys. I don't think that this coverage is, is a 100% known. This could, I think it's match quarters, personally. It could be a, a, some form of cover seven, to be quite honest. Uh, it's between one of those type of coverages is, is what I'm seeing here. But with that said, I'm going to go match quarters is what I think it is. But watch the loop. We get a loop on here. We, we stun. The looper is going to be Josh Sweat, and then we got Sweat for the sack, my guys. So, I mean, I got to be honest with you guys, looking at the All-22, I may have started off with the intention of showing you man coverage snaps. I came away really impressed with Jonathan Gannon's aggressiveness. It's one game. It's one sample size. But Kirk Cousins is a quarterback that can eat you alive if you just sit back in zones and let him operate without pressure in his face and then see the you know see your coverage and and know where to go with the football. He's a guy that can absolutely eat you alive. I saw progression from Gannon here. Okay, I don't know if this was a you know one of those moments where the players and the coaches came together and said, "Hey man, we gotta have we gotta have this heart to heart. We gotta have this realization, this real talk here." And then they came up with the idea and the game plan. I'm not sure, but I noticed a difference here. I noticed a very very clear difference in the play calling. All right, guys, I can't project what's going to happen going forward. I hope I see this going forward, but who knows? I appreciate y'all so much, guys. Leave your comments down below. Tell me what you think. I love the creativity and the aggressiveness of Gannon in this game. I thought this was by far the best game I, I observed Gannon call, and that includes the Detroit game last year. I just think that we won with individual matchups more so last year in Detroit. Still had an element of this this year in, with Minnesota, but... Outside of the individual plays made by Slay and some stuff like that with the corners, Bradbury, I also thought there was some conceptual and design stuff here, right? The, the, the trick, the deception, the way of deceiving the quarterback that I thought Gannon did a good job of. He turned the volume up, the heat up on O'Connell. I liked it, guys. All right, guys. I appreciate y'all's time and attention. I'll see y'all in the next video.